Welcome back y'all to In The Wild and joining me we have some very special people. They, I want to I say you do a lot for the community but also <laughs> for Jag Nation. Uh, Christy Johnson who is our community engagement manager and mm -hmm. Tina Baggett who is our assistant vice president for volunteer services and community engagement. Welcome back Thanks. to the show. Thanks for having us. We're so excited to have y'all back. Um, let's get started by talking about any goals that y'all may have for this new year. So career, for our community engagement? Career, personal, whatever you feel like sharing. <laughs> well, personal, I'll say travel more. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta get out and, and see the world for sure. Personal goals, um, I'll go with travel. I like okay. that one. I like that one. <laughs> Um, and to just do more of my hobbies, like to invest some more, like, me time. Gotcha. Yeah. I definitely want to travel there. a lot more. Um, I was talking earlier to uh, some folks when we were talking about concerts coming up. And so uh, Beyonce is supposed to be going on a concert uh. this summer. And Rihanna is supposed to be going, so I'm like, if my wallet will allow it, I'm trying to go everywhere. You better save up or yeah, yeah, just, I want to see everybody. Um, so, Christy, how was your first semester? Wow. So in Jag Nation. My first semester in Jag Nation, I'm not new anymore. Yeah. <laughs> it was wonderful. Um, I learned a lot, and I'm still learning a lot. And it also, even with the learning, it also felt a bit like coming home because, you know, we've talked before, I'm a double jag. So I feel really, really uh, grateful to be able to serve the institution that gave so much to me. Yes. Uh, so you're here today to talk about our newest project, yes. Jagpulse. So for those who are still unfamiliar, can you tell us a little bit about Jagpulse um, and how Jag Nation can get involved? Awesome. So Jag Pulse is Augusta University's new community engagement platform. And essentially, it will allow AU faculty, students, volunteers, staff to find volunteer opportunities and to track their own volunteer hours and to also find service learning opportunities and by the end of a student's career here at Augusta University, they'll be able to pull down their own report showing their service learning transcript. And that's a wonderful thing uh, for employers to also be able to see. Um, one reason why we uh, invested in Jag Pulse is also because it becomes a front door for community partners. And I bet Tina can also piggyback on this a, a bit. So community partners were reaching out to several different entities to find like we want AU volunteers where do we find them and so Jag Pulse is like this wonderful front door for community partners and that's one thing that we like about it. Yeah this is really the first time that our community organizational partners have been able to connect directly with our students um, in a way that allows them to share these wonderful timely service um, and engagement opportunities that they just never had before so um, at this point, Chrissy's been working hard the last six months or so, five <laughs> yeah. or six months, and really has uh, worked to uh, bring our community partners to the table and get them excited about being a part of this program. So I think, how many do we have in the system now, Chrissy? 67. Yeah. Oh, wow. So partners. close mm -hmm. to 70 partners, and, and that number is only going to grow. Yes. Uh, and these are community organizations who's, who are just very excited about engaging with our students, finding opportunities to help them learn, give them some great unique experiences that they wouldn't get other places. So um, we're really building on some great momentum to, um, to share some great experiences with our students. How long did it take to build out Jack Pulse from like the ideation phase to now where we're launching it? So this is, this has been, this kernel has been growing for a <laughs> while. Um, this has been years in the making as, you know, as far as, you know, really looking at what other universities are doing in the community engagement space. And, you know, fundamentally, how do other universities track and uh, report on community engagement? Um, and also, how do we make community engagement 
more accessible to our students. That's, I mean, that's the bottom line. And so um, as we talked with other universities, we saw that this, this platform, um, which is, you know, generally known as give polls, um, is kind of the standard for, you know, really strong community engagement all over the, the country and, and, and especially all in Georgia as well. Um, so it's really been growing for years and um, we were able to secure the resources that we needed to, to go ahead and start growing our, our little um, <laughs> seed into a sapling, right? So um, we are at the very beginning of this journey, I think now, um, as we start to promote it across our campuses. Seeing that this is new, would those volunteers or those who are already involved in your office be able to track things that they've already done or how would that work we can't go back very far but there are some possibilities for uploading data that um, we actually will be training admins tomorrow literally tomorrow we'll be training against the university administrators so those are folks in the colleges uh, for instance in the dental college in the medical college in Pamplin, in Hull, who all have been designated as the Jack Pulse point person, so the back end. And so they'll actually get their training on tomorrow, and so they'll learn more about how they can put in some hours that have already been submitted. Because you're right, it's not that we don't do these great things in the community, now we're trying to capture and show people the great things that we do in the community. Yeah, that was something that I thought about because we do have some really involved students and yeah. I'm sure that they would want to be able to put all as much as they can, of course. And we want them to. Mm -hmm. We want them to. Um, one of the goals of the university's strategic plan is to get that Carnegie uh, community engagement classification. Um, how is Jack Pulse going to help with that? So the Carnegie classification really is, it's a framework. It's kind of like a an instruction guide to how do I make, um, how do we as an institution make our institution more community engaged and um, more effective in our community engagement work. So the, um, this one of the pieces, kind of one of the, the pieces of being very effective in community engagement is being able to understand and assess the community engagement that's going on. Mm -hmm. Right now we don't have a way to do that. We can't tell you here's how many service hours that our students do, and not in a, not in a holistic way. You know, some colleges track it, some don't. Some, everybody tracks it a different way. So what JAG also does is give us some consistency in the way that we report and assess um, the work, the, our efforts. Um, so, and really that's the first time that we've had that um, as AU, AU as a whole. So it's pretty exciting. So again, just being able to track and report on our activity that's kind of one of the foundational pieces of, um, of really improving and, and growing our community engagement work. Is there anything else that goes into that classification besides the reporting? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> There's so much. Um, really, the, the, the assessment really looks at, um, the, or the classification kind of the, the uh, framework looks at how do we partner with, with our community? as an institution, how do we engage our faculty and staff in community engaged efforts? Um, how do we tie community engagement into our student curriculum? And then how do we also engage uh, community, community in our co-curricular activities, so outside of the classroom that, that also supports um, our curricular uh, experience. So kind of if you think about those four pillars, that's, there's a lot that falls under that. That, that makes sense. Um, and for those who are like me who didn't realize that there was a classification mm -hmm. for this, uh, what makes that so important? And what would it mean to the university to have it, hopefully uh, by 2026? That's a, that's a great question. Um, you know, the bottom line is that research shows that universities that really embrace and engage in community engaged practices, um, and, and I mean really commit to it, they have better student outcomes. And that's you know, that's why we're all here. Mm -hmm. You know, we graduate our students um, at a higher rate. We retain them at a higher rate. Our students are happier. They have a more positive experience. Now we know that lots of other things also go into those metrics, but fundamentally it's one of those high impact practices, one of those high impact things that, that contributes to student outcomes. And 
Um, as we know, that's another one of our goals, right, in growing our enrollment. Um, so all these things kind of tie together, but um, the bottom line is that we make it a better place for our students. And, and, and the, the way that we do that is by having a supportive community who's excited about partnering with us. Uh, going back to Jag Polls for a second, uh, how do students and uh, those who are interested, how can they sign up? Oh, Where are they awesome. going to sign up? That's an easy question, uh, easy answer. So for those who are interested in signing up, you will go to augusta.givepulse.com. You'll see our landing page, wonderful video, marketing folks put together. But from there, you're going to click log in. And once you've logged in, you will actually see uh, your uh, an opportunity to log in via your Augusta University credentials. So this is the great thing. You don't have to create a new username or password at all. You can use the username and password that you use to sign in anywhere um, on campus at augusta.edu. You'll sign in. You'll notice that it kind of already knows you. And so the first thing that it'll prompt you to do is to build your profile. And we do want you to build, build your profile as much as possible, be as thorough as possible, because that kind of allows, uh, not just me on the back end, but for community partners to kind of make matches. It's almost kind of like a, a matchmaking service for, <laughs> for um, potential volunteers and nonprofit organizations. Once you've built your profile out, you can go to our homepage. You'll see where community partners have already posted events. We are literally already have um, folks who have posted events for January and February and decide whether or not you want to serve. And if you want to serve, you'll click on the event. And once the event is done or the opportunity is done, you'll log your impact. So they don't have any reason to wait. They can start they, right now. You can start today. <laughs> <laughs> we know that a lot of our, our a lot of our students have volunteer service requirements through their programs. Yes. So this is a one stop shop where they can go in and mm -hmm. find things in one place versus having to go all over town looking for different opportunities. Is there anything else coming up within your office that you're excited to share with us? I know Jack Post is the biggest part of it right <laughs> now, but is there anything else? Yes, so on Wednesday the 18th and Thursday the 19th of January this month, uh, we are hosting Jack Pulse launch parties. So, you, and again, you don't have to wait until the launch party to start <laughs> going to the website, but we do invite everyone to come out. So on Wednesday the 18th, the Jack Pulse launch party will be held in the JSAC Breezeway on Somerville campus. We'll have pizza, There'll be drinks, soda. Uh, <laughs> let, me, let me be really, really clear on that, soda. Uh, there'll be uh, uh, Augustus will make an appearance. There'll be music. So it'll be a really um, a party atmosphere. But the most important thing is that some of our community partners who've already posted events on Jack Pulse and opportunities will be there in person. So it'll be your opportunity to log in to Jack Pulse, meet the actual community partners who want to meet your AU student volunteers, and sign on to the site and get started. Um, get started using Jack Pulse. And on Thursday, the 19th, we'll be doing the same exact thing, Augustus, pizza, music, soda. <laughs> um, it will be um, at the Ed Commons lobby uh, located on R.A. Dent Boulevard. And both events will be from 11.30 a.m. to 1 p.m. All right. Thank you all so much. I'm so excited to check out Jag Pulse. And I hope everyone watching is excited to check out Jag Pulse because it's going to make a huge impact. Absolutely. Thanks, y'all. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs>
Our mission is to create connected communities that offer transformative experiences and memorable moments for the students of Augusta University. We offer several activities such as spring clean, we host the Miss Augusta University pageant, we offer opportunities for student leaders, and we have three councils for fraternity and sorority life to include the College Panhellenic Council, the Interfraternity Council, and the National Panhellenic Council. If you are interested in joining an organization or becoming engaged with our office, please visit us in the JSAC or go to our website at augusta.edu slash studentlife. Welcome back y'all to In the Wild and joining us virtually, we have an awesome student. Uh, not only is he a medical student, but he's also a author, book publisher, and we're gonna talk to him all about that. So give a warm jack or welcome for Mr. Tyler Beauchamp. How's it going? It's going well, thanks for having me. Uh, thanks for being here. And you are in Savannah right now, um, taking your classes. You told us you just uh, took boards. How did how do you feel about them? Feeling good. We're in a, a month, like a two month sort of course of board exams and then I get back to the hospital. Okay. Um, so just getting started here, tell us a little bit about yourself and why you applied to MCG. Yeah, yeah. So I'm actually from Savannah, Georgia. Um, so it was nice to have that opportunity to come back home and kind of do part of medicine near my, my family. Um, but I, I went to North Carolina for school. I didn't think I was actually gonna do medicine. I was kind of all over the place and did like, I swear like 12 or 13 different majors, just like spread oh, wow. around. At one point it was creative writing. So I did a okay. little bit of this came back up. Um, but yeah, and then it was later in college when I was like, I really, really wanna go to med school. Um, I fell in love with medicine. Um, I kind of grew up as a patient. I had some joint problems that went around different research clinics, so that I kind of got exposure from that side of the curtain. So then when I started working with some people in healthcare, I got to see the other side, and it was just, it was nice to kind of know, okay, this is my, this is my realm for, this is where I feel comfortable being. Um, but yeah, and then I was fortunate, I knew I wanted to stay in the South. I uh, I see myself staying in the Southeast practicing, so MCG was a great fit to come here. Um, and then, you know, I got to be in Augusta for a little bit, and then I didn't even know when I came to Augusta that they had satellite campuses. And then it was such a cool opportunity to be able to go back to Savannah and work with a lot of the doctors that like were my doctors when I was growing up, which is very, very cool for sure. Oh yeah, I bet that is a full circle moment from being a patient, but also being able to go back to where you were, I guess, being a patient. Yeah, and I think it was weirder, weirder for them than it was for me. For me, <laughs> I was really excited, but then they're like, wait, didn't I, didn't I treat you? Or was not your pediatrician? <laughs> <laughs> um, so what has your MCG experience been like so far? Oh, it's been great. Uh, you know, I, I was a little old worried about just starting med school coming from, I went to a really, really small high school and I got, I was very happy going to a really large university because I got to break out of that big shell. And then coming back to med school, I was like, oh, I don't know if I'm ready to go back to something small, but MCG, you know, MCG is a large medical school compared to most. And I, I found that I was able to make it small and large when I wanted it to. So I was able to get like really close with some people that I consider like family now. Um, and then also coming together, you have all the other allied campuses with the you know dental college and PA. So it really is large when you want it to be as well. Um, and I really, really love the town. Um, I didn't have too much exposure. I grew up in Savannah, but I didn't have too many experiences in Augusta. So it was a completely new, I think the first time I ever went to Augusta was for my interview. Um, and I really, really liked, liked being around there. It's been a great, Great time. I'm excited to go back. I finally get to go back after, you know, a year or so away in March for my, my sub -I. Uh So tell us about your schedule right now being a med student, because I'm sure you're pretty busy. I am, yeah. Um, so I had just finished up my third year. If you ask any med student right now, in a different year, they all have different schedules. It's very, very confusing for sure. But basically, like after you finish your two years, in the books, you do some form of 
cycling through all the different specialties, getting like hands-on practice, and that's where you decide like what field you want to pursue ultimately. Um, so I finished that, and then I took uh, a year off for a mix of some medical treatment as well as some research. Um, so I'm coming back in now uh, and am taking sort of these mini boards over like the next two months, which are tests on all the different uh, specialties followed up by like a final big board over it all. And then I start my fourth year where I, I'm doing uh, pediatrics. So I start uh, a sub I a little internship in pediatrics in MCG. And for the next year, I kind of cycle around different in the wards, in the hospital rotations um, of various pediatric specialties. How do you balance your social life and your education? That's a great question. <laughs> uh, I, you know, something I definitely learned fast was to make the time that you have count. It's not about how much time you have for yourself all the time. You know, you're, you are accepting, like, you know, it's going to be a lot of work as anything is. Um, but it's more important to focus on when you have the time to make it count and make this experience as meaningful. And for me, that really manifested in I got close with a few people very intimately and closely, and we uh, were able to uh, kind of bond and share experiences over the years, um, whether it's just a dinner once a week, or uh, we all go watch an episode of something, or we go take a walk around the river, just, you know, it's, it, it became less about, you know, we can't obviously like go take a whole weekend off away, or maybe like that, that's, you can't do that all the time, but the times you can make the little things throughout the week, or even just, it's a busy week, I'm gonna do a quick call, five minutes there to check in, um, you know, stuff like that. Uh, you definitely, sometimes you are worried about being vulnerable that way, saying, hey, I really need you know you to look out for me because I'm going through a lot, but then you know that you wanna do that for them too. So I think part of the experience of going through medicine in medical school is that the social uh, the social aspect is bred in because you have to rely on each other through the tough times. So. so with that being said, how did you find time to write and publish a book? Yeah, so, you know, it's, there are very little silver linings of COVID. You know, it was a very <laughs> tough time on everybody. Um, and it was a very tough time on me and uh, my family as well. Um, I've always wanted to write. I've, I've written since I was little. It's always been very intimate and personal, just something I do in my free time. And I've rarely showed it to anybody. Um, but I came up with this idea uh, right near the start of COVID. And basically what I would do is I would find myself at the end of the day or the end of the week when I finish studying, you know, I don't have the other responsibilities going into the hospital because those were taken away. A lot of the groups I was involved in are shut down, so what am I gonna do? And I just found myself as an outlet writing more often than I'd ever in my entire life. And I never intended, I never intended to publish it. Um, but the more I was writing it, the more I felt I had something to say. It was, for me, it was a very compelling story uh, targeting a lot of issues that kids are facing these days too. Um, and after about a year, I realized I had a full manuscript and I was like I wonder I wonder if it's possible to, to make this work so you know it wasn't until I finished it that I had realized that I had actually written a book it was really just a, an outlet for a year oh wow um, but then from there you just start re researching editors and publishers and stuff like that so yeah tell us about your book and where the idea came from yeah, absolutely. Uh, so it's called Freeze Frame, um, and it's about this boy in high school who he experiences this trauma, which kind of leaves him with a fractured sense of reality. And the high school he's in is this art school, and he wants to be a, he's an aspiring film director. And the way his uh, emotional breaks manifest is when his emotions get too strong in a certain area, his world forms into a movie of that emotion. So like he'll oh, be going wow. through the halls and someone will scare him from behind and suddenly it, the hallway will transform into a horror movie or you know he falls for somebody and suddenly he's playing out with rom-com stereotypes and everything. And so the, the book is about him overcoming this trauma 
uh, recovering, uh, kind of realizing what it takes to um, you know take care of your mental health in today's age, uh, and also it's a very much a coming in story with these friends that bring him in. There's a little bit of competition in, and the main antagonists uh, are, funny enough, like various social influencers in high school. Oh, wow. Um, something I've noticed, something I've noticed in working with peds is like the, the dynamics of what's cool and what's not cool has really shifted since uh, I was in high school. You know, it's not always about how fast you can run or how big you are, or like what car you have. It's like, who has more followers or who has, you know, so there's those little things that I thought were really interesting and how, how do people combat that and how do they treat each other with that being like the social currency. Um, so I, you know, I get to talk about those issues too, as well as mental health. Obviously it was bred out of, uh, me, uh, in quarantine and COVID. I, um, I actually at the time was living in this apartment that had no windows and it didn't even have a door. It had like a sort of, a kind of like sliding pantry door. Very much oh, like wow. a kind of prison cell thing that you would shut. <laughs> it was totally, totally not up to code. Um, but like, I didn't know if it was day or night or if it was, I, I go get ready to go run. You know, I need a break. And then I go to walk outside and it's raining and I had no mm. idea because I'm in like this windowless room. So like, it was definitely not a healthy environment to be in while you're studying all day and, you know, stressed with med school. Um, and out of that, I kind of had this idea, what if a kid was walking through high school today, but it was like he was, like his head was surrounded in that box um, and everything else is happening outside of him. Um, so that was definitely a big, uh, inspiring part of the story. But so, I'm, I should say though, I'm definitely not him. I, I get asked <laughs> a lot, like if I'm the main character, it's based on, you know, I'm definitely not him at all. We're very different people. <laughs> <laughs> um. So what has the response been like after it was published? It's been really great. I, I was, you know, very blessed to have the response that I did at first. I know um, I had like some goals that I really, really wanted just to have. I don't know. I, I plan on writing more, so I wanted to at least make a name for myself to, you know, push forward future books. And I don't really know what that means, um, but I think I, I think I've gotten that goal at least. I had some other things that like I really want to get. It'd be cool to get like a bestseller status or it'd be cool to win an award or stuff like that. And I don't really know what it would take to do that. Um, and then I was very fortunate because like in the first month of release, I hit a uh, number one bestseller on Amazon on a few different categories, which is like, oh, I like, I like pulled my car over when someone called me that. And I quickly went on Amazon and checked because like, the, you know, that stuff changes like every hour. So it's cool. Like I got it at least for an hour. It was there. Um, <laughs> and, um, but, but more than that stuff, the stuff that was like been really special is that I got to go on this press tour, the circuit tour around, um, about, like different news outlets and magazines and very cool. My favorite schools. I got to go talk at various high schools and middle schools, you know, kids that had read the book. And then, like, t talk to the classes and then, like, you know, hear from the readers. I got to go to, like, a Barnes & Noble event because it's in Barnes & Noble now and have readers come up and do book signings and, and like, talk to kids, and, which is, like, my, you know, target audience for it. So that was, you know, I'll remember that for the rest of my life. And what was the publishing process like? Like, who did you go to? How did you find out who you needed to go to to get your book to all these people in all these places to, to be purchased. Yeah, right. So, I mean, when I started, I had no idea. Um, I, I think I actually just Googled one day, how do you publish a book? I just, I have this, I don't know what to do. And of course, when I finished writing, I thought it was perfect done and I hadn't even gotten an editor yet. And then, you know, nine revisions later, we got oh, wow. to the we at, so. That's very. That's why it's so important to get editors because you don't even realize some of the mistakes you're making. Um, but no, I was fortunate. Another student in my class uh, had published a book a few years earlier, and so I was a nuisance to her for about a month or so. To, like, I want to hear everything you did. Tell me like what you find, and like give me all all the advice you can. And there are a lot of self-publishing companies. Uh, available today because it's kind of the industry's really changed. Um, 
it's really hard to get a manuscript into a traditional publisher without a literary agent. But most agents won't take you unless you're an established author. So it's like, how do you get a job or an internship without previous experience kind of stuff, yeah. you know? Um, but these self-publishing companies will like let you retain the rights and they themselves just help uh, format and get editors together and collaborators and a little bit of marketing. And then through a lot of means, like Amazon's got a nice publisher these days, um, Barnes & Noble and Ingram have. So there's like, there's these avenues that people can put out, anyone can publish, um, but it's more about how do you get the full package ready. And so these companies, I found one and clicked with this group of people that I really, really enjoyed. Um, and I was very adamant from the beginning with the editor. I don't want you to go soft on me. You know, I want to learn from this process. So like, don't, don't just tell me what I want to hear. Tell me if it doesn't sound good. Um, and they definitely uh, took me up on that for the first <laughs> few, which I'm very, very appreciative of. We, I, I was so thankful that they did because by the time we finished, it was like, it's not that the ideas of the book had changed, but I realized I wasn't doing what I needed to do to really get certain ideas across to the reader. So um, that definitely was a make or break it for the book. What did your parents and close friends think when the book was published? Oh, they were, they were over the moon. Uh, my, so my dad, he's kind of like the creative in our family. He's a musician um, and he works in uh, sound design with like TV and film. Um, but, uh, you know, ever, and my mom's the mathematician. So me going to uh, med school, you know, she, she could understand it more because she's like, oh, this is so cool that the sciences, you know, the, 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 that I understand that half of the brain. And my dad, who always saw me as like writing, growing up, like, no, no, he's going to do writing. He's going to do that. And so when I did medicine, he's like, oh, I hope he still writes one day. He was the most excited, I think, out of everybody. Um, but they were all, all thrilled. Um, it was really nice being in Savannah, actually, uh, while I'm releasing it because it's, you know, my hometown. So I got to do like some events around the hometown. Um, I, my first book signing was thrown by like a local, a local bar, like outdoor, like marsh area, and like I got to see like old family, friends, and teachers and stuff come. So I had a really nice local response. And last question: Where can we go to purchase Freeze Frame? <laughs> yeah, uh, so you can go. It's on Amazon. Uh, it's on Barnes and Noble. Uh, you can go to my website, uh, tyler Um and I think, yeah, I think that's it. <laughs> well, Tyler, thank you so much for talking to us. I know I am very interested in this book. Uh, Kitana, I am sure. Yeah, Kitana likes to read, and she likes to write as well, so I'm sure she's going to... I'm listening to everything you said. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. All right, well, we'll be talking to you soon. Congratulations. Thanks so much for having me. Have a great day. Hi, so I'm Dr. Lorraine Evans, and I'm the Executive Director of the Academic Success Center. Augusta University wants all of our students to be successful inside and outside of the classroom. And the Academic Success Center is for that inside of the classroom part. We want all of our students to be able to reach their goals and their academic potential. At the Academic Success Center, we have peer tutors, and these are students who have taken the classes that you are now visiting them for, so they can help you learn the strategies and skills and things that you need to do for that course. We also have peer coaches, and peer coaches are gonna help you with time management and, and new study strategies for those courses that you haven't had before. And then we have our workshops. And so once or twice a week, we have workshops that are about topics specific to that week. So we'll have exam preparation um, workshops or we'll have workshops about how to, you know, manage your final schedule type thing. The Academic Success Center is here to help you be successful in your classes and we hope to see you here.